Welcome to the NFC West huddle where we talk all the big storylines around the division with experts in each city. I'm Alyssa Charleston in Seattle. I'm joined by Robbie Baker in Phoenix, Keyshawn Ward in San Francisco and Gerard Moncure in Los Angeles. Two preseason games down, one to go, and I'm already tired of the preseason, but still some great storylines to watch for each team we cover. Let's start in Los Angeles with Gerard Moncure, who joins us from the Chargers facility. Gerard, can you explain why Rams head coach Sean McVay essentially benched himself in the second preseason game? Yeah, he watched this game uh, against the Chargers, by the way, at SoFi Stadium from the box, because what he was doing was giving his assistant head coach, Aubrey Pleasant, a chance to actually coach the team. Now, why did he do this? Because McVay is a motivator and he's progressive in terms of his coaching style and his coaching tree because of that is long and lengthy in the NFL. What Pleasant got last weekend was a chance to actually add to his resume that he can do the job. So what happened on Saturday was just Sean McVay doing what Sean McVay does, getting guys ready for head coaching positions in the NFL. Yeah, you got to be confident to do that. I think it was a cool move. Keyshawn Ward covers the San Francisco 49ers. We saw QB1 Brock Purdy see some action over in a win over the New Orleans Saints. How did he look and any other takeaways from that game? Well, Brock Purdy did look a bit flustered at times, but we had to apply context. Three out of five offensive line were starting for him and zero at the skill position. And I'll kind of give you guys an example. On third down, Brock Purdy was improvising and moving the pocket. He was telling Brandon Willis to come back towards the sideline, but he kept moving north. And the miscommunication is there, and Brock Purdy threw it away. And you can tell he was very frustrated by that performance. But, I mean, the glaring thing was the amount of pressures of coming at Purdy. But I think all that will be fixed once the starters are with Purdy. All right, and Robbie, the Cardinals are still looking for their first win in the preseason, which again is completely meaningless. But Jonathan Gannon didn't play many starters, so which was more valuable in your opinion, the joint practices against the Indianapolis Colts or the actual game? Yeah, I think these joint practices were something that the Cardinals had kind of circled in their offseason program for a while. Obviously, Jonathan Gannon and Shane Steichen have a lot of familiarity from their time in Philadelphia with the Eagles. And no Kyler Murray during the preseason. We found that out fairly early, early on in training camp. These joint practices, I think a whole week of work with ones against ones, twos on twos, all that tape, all that film is something that I think the Cardinals knew would benefit them probably more than Kyler playing one series in a game. Marvin Harrison played in the season opener, preseason opener against the Saints, three snaps. It was two run plays and a screen to a running back. There's not much you're going to learn from that. The, this Cardinals team has kind of taken a very cautious approach to the preseason, but they went after it in those joint practices. I think that was really what, something that they were going to glean. They knew they were going to glean a lot of information from in those joint practices with the Colts, and they kind of put all their effort into that. Okay, very interesting. And as for the Seahawks, the main takeaways was really Sam Howell solidifying his job as the backup behind Geno Smith. He was 11 for 14, and then P.J. Walker came in. He just couldn't keep the offense on the field. It didn't seem like he had the same command over Ryan Grubb's new offense for the Seahawks in Tennessee against the Titans. They lost by one. I think we also found out the defensive line is even deeper than we might have thought. Derek Hall had a great game. We also saw Mike Morris, who played for Mike McDonald, the new head coach for the Seahawks, at Michigan when he was the defensive coordinator. So those two continue to show the depth, and all of these guys are rotating on the defense. We've heard Leonard Williams, who will be a starter, say they've learned like five or six different positions, uh, each of those players, so they'll be moving up and down the defense. Cannot wait to see what they look like against the Cleveland Browns, even though I don't think we will see starters. So quickly with each of you, and I mean about 30 seconds, factoring in injuries and how each team's starters have looked in training camp, what's the biggest strength and weakness of your teams? Gerard, we'll start with you in Los Angeles. Well, the biggest strength of the, of the Rams is a, a healthy Matthew Stafford. You know, he's missed a little bit of time with hamstring tightness, but he is practicing against the uh, Houston Texans. He will not play in the upcoming preseason game, the final game. But that is the strength of the Rams, that offensive line who's experienced now. And, um, of course, Matthew Stafford, a Super Bowl winning quarterback. That's the strength of the Rams. All right. And, Robbie, the strength of the Phoenix Cardinals, or Phoenix, <laughs> the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> 
Yeah, the biggest strength, similar to what Gerard just said, for the Cardinals is Kyler Murray. A healthy Kyler Murray, this time last year, that was not what the Cardinals had. Kyler Murray was watching from the sidelines. It wasn't until week 10 when he came back last year. A healthy Kyler Murray going through the entire offseason program, an entire training camp. Yes, he's not playing in the preseason, but having all of these reps all of this time with this first team offense is something that I think is going to be incredibly valuable for this Cardinals team. And Keyshawn Ward, the 49ers are the favorite by most uh, standards to win the NFC West. So what is the strength that you're seeing right now out of the 49ers? Well, I don't think nobody's really talking about it, but I think it's their secondary. There's a three-way battle at the safety spot with Hufunga being out right now dealing with that, you know, torn ACL. But he'll be back soon. But you got George Oldham, Jair Brown, and the rookie, Malik <laughs> Mustafa, who comes with the boom. This is a three-way battle that's going to be really good. And I think we might see something similar to 2012 when you had Dante Whitner and Deshaun Golson being all pro. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the secondary looks on week one. That is why I love this show, because we find out things that we wouldn't already know. Thank you to each of you. The warm-up is over here on the NFC West Huddle. After the break, we're getting closer to that 53-man roster cutdown date. How is each coach treating the third and final preseason game? And will we see starters? That's next. Welcome back to the NFC West Huddle, where right now we all have to take the preseason way too seriously. The final game before the regular season is this weekend, and teams have to cut their roster down to 53 players next Tuesday on the 27th of August. Keyshawn Ward in San Francisco. How is the 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan viewing this last game before the regular season, and will we see any starters? I think Kyle Shannon is going to treat it as a dress rehearsal. Just because the fact that we haven't seen George Kittle, Fred Warner, Nick Bosa, and plenty of other starters for the Niners haven't really suited up just yet against the Titans or Saints. So you'll see them on the field probably two or three series. But be on the lookout for a rookie wide receiver, Jacob Cowan, who's been kind of making plays throughout camp and his last game against the Saints. He can really cement himself in this offense if he has another great game. And Robbie, similar question to you. What's Jonathan Gannon's plan against the Denver Broncos? I think the plan for Gannon and this staff is going to be the backups and guys kind of on the fringes of this roster. The, those guys are going to see the bulk of the playing time. And specifically, the backup quarterback battle. Clayton Toon and Desmond Ritter, those two guys will see the bulk of the quarterback play. They've been going back and forth in camp. Who will be QB2 behind Kyler Murray and a looming roster decision, will they keep two quarterbacks behind Kyler Murray? Will this be three quarterbacks ultimately on the 53-man roster? If they keep three quarterbacks, that means someone else obviously is going to have to get cut. Is a special teams player got to go maybe try to the uh, make their way into the practice squad? Clayton Toon and Desmond Ritter, the two guys to watch on Sunday for the Broncos, and the Cardinals playing in that kind of later window on Sunday perhaps maybe a little disadvantage because they're going to have a little less time evaluating that game film before that Tuesday roster cutdown decision looms. Well, Seahawks head coach Mike McDonald said we will see most of their starters when they begin the game against the Cleveland Browns this Saturday. That means Geno Smith will get some reps. He didn't say how many or how long he'll play, but on offense and defense, we'll get a way better look at the Seahawks team in terms of how they look under a new head coach. I'm sure they'll still keep their offense and defense pretty vanilla, but for Seahawks fans getting to see this team at home at Lumen Field against the Browns, it'll be an exciting moment to see some of those starters and how they look under a new offensive and defensive system. Well, this time of year, we start seeing betting odds everywhere for everything. After the break, we'll find out who would put money down on whether Aaron Rodgers will be the NFL Comeback Player of the Year and more. That's next. Welcome back. It's time for What Are the Odds? We'll look at a few sportsbook betting lines and find out which one of us would put metaphorical money down on them right now. First one, I'll give you the over-under win total for each team that we cover. You tell me which one you're actually taking. Robbie in Phoenix, the Cardinals over-under for win total. Jump to seven and a half wins. What do you think? Yeah, that's going to be kind of right on the number, I think. This team won four games last year, but they were 3-5 and five when Kyler Murray returned to the lineup. I think seven to eight wins is really kind of the wheelhouse for this team this year. I would, I'll take the over. I think maybe they get to eight wins, but if they get to eight wins, they have to start strong. You look at the beginning of their schedule this season, at the Bills, then the Rams, Lions, Commanders, 49ers, and at the Packers. It is a tough gauntlet to start the season, but if they can steal a few wins in there, I think they could get to eight wins this season.
Well, the total for the 49ers, Keyshawn, is 11 and a half, just light expectations. What do you think about that number? You got to take the over. I think this 49ers team is too stacked across the board. I mean, even just looking at their first six games, they should breeze through the Jets, Cardinals, Patriots, Rams. No knock against y'all, but this team is just too stacked across the board. And I also believe that they may have 13 or 14 wins, and I guarantee you they'll probably be in an NFC title game or a Super Bowl. And I hate to say it, but it's really hard to doubt that. They have talent all over the place down in San Francisco. The Seahawks over under win total is set at seven and a half. I'm taking the over, and I think a seven and a half is sort of a sign of respect for Mike McDonald coming in because he takes over a team that was just downright bad on defense, especially run defense for the past two years. Offensively, they would start well, and then they'd be completely silent for the second and third quarter, and then they'd somewhat make a game of it in the fourth quarter. So I think I trust Ryan Grubb coming in, as we saw what he did at Washington, leading the Huskies to their first national championship game since the 90s. I'm curious to see how that carries over into the NFL and how other teams adjust against it. But I do think that Jackson Smith and Jigba, who was a rookie last year will take a huge leap and he won't just be a short field target he's going to go deeper he's going to be more like a Jalen McMillan or you know a Roma Dunze who was you know electric for the Huskies last year I think seven and a half especially from a defensive perspective really gets me excited for the Seahawks so I think I'm going over I think the Seahawks team could win nine games and that's even a low bar I think they might be able to do more they're in a tough division, no doubt, though, with the San Francisco 49ers and the L.A. Rams. Well, next one is a little bit more fun. It's a futures bet. New York Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers is the favorite to be named NFL Comeback Player of the Year. Now, we know Rodgers tore his Achilles in the season opener last year after just a few snaps. The money line is plus 150. Robbie, we're going with you first. Are you taking those odds? I don't know. I guess I'll have fun with this, too. Who had Joe Flacco winning comeback player of the year last year, right? So I'll go a little long shot here. Mike Tomlin has never had a losing season in the NFL, right? We still don't know if Justin Fields or Russell Wilson will be QB1 in Pittsburgh, but sprinkle in a little something on either of those guys as a, maybe some longer odds. Just with what Mike Tomlin does with the Steelers, eh, maybe a little bit of uh, a little fun there throwing something on those guys. Oh, I love a little spice, a little make it interesting, Robbie. Thank you. Gerard, we're going to you next. Would you put money on Rodgers becoming this year's NFL Comeback Player of the Year? Comeback Player of the Year, yes. But that division, you know, Buffalo's won that division uh, three, four straight years. And Miami was the leading offensive team in the NFL last year with Tua Tagovailoa at the helm. Obviously, they added Odell Beckham Jr., to that offense. Um, I mean, the Jets might be the third best team in that division when we start. So I, I see New York maybe finishing third, which is not going to help him, you know, be the comeback player at all. That's, that's my opinion. Oh, okay. Well, we love hot takes. So Keyshawn, can you top that hot take? What do you think about Rogers? No, I'm, I'm slamming my money down. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to shock a lot of people this year. I am going to say my hot take is he might be in a conversation for offense player of the year. When you look at this Jets team, they're probably one of the best defenses in our offense. He has an ascending star with Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams on the outside, plus Brees Hall. So he, all those skilled players that he has at his opposing will, I think this is going to be a great year for Aaron Rodgers, and they will at least get to a division round playoff game. Well, shoot, as long as he spent some time in a bunker underneath the ground and getting right with his mental, uh, as he is known to do, I think I'm putting money down on him being the NFL Comeback Player of the Year. He has a lot of another chip on his shoulder, a guy with a chip on his shoulder, and some fun weapons on offense. Uh, Brees Hall was my fantasy running back, quarter, uh, running back last year. I trust in him with my whole life. So uh, interesting to see what he does next season for the Jets. Up next, we'll put everyone on the clock in a game-like scenario as we discuss the best and worst quarterback in the NFC West heading into the season. The two-minute drill is next. 
Well, just like a game, we're finishing the NFC West huddle with a two minute drill. How quarterbacks operate the end of a game often determines how we rank them and how we feel about them. So each of us has about 30 seconds to explain which quarterback in the NFC West between Geno Smith, Brock Purdy, Matthew Stafford and Kyler Murray. You have the least confidence in this season and then we'll do who you have the most confidence in. So Robbie in Phoenix, we'll start with you. The least confidence, I guess I would probably have to go Geno Smith only because he had his back-to-back -back career seasons these last two seasons with the Seahawks, right? Can he keep up that pace? Historically in his career, he hasn't been able to. At 33 years old, the supporting cast isn't quite the same as what the other teams in the NFC West have to offer. Least confidence for me, probably Geno Smith. All right, and Keyshawn, who do you believe is the, gives you the least confidence in terms of quarterbacks in the NFC West? I got to say Geno Smith as well. I don't honestly think he's going to be the quarterback there next year. I just think that, you know, he's kind of had his best seasons he's ever had in his career. But I think opposing defenses are starting to catch up on him. And it's, when he's doing on offense, I just don't think it's going to be enough, especially comparing a guy against guys like Stafford, Purdy, and Kyler Murray. All right, Gerard, are you trying to put more bulletin board material out there for Geno Smith? What do you think? I, I'm going to leave the Emerald City alone. I, I'm going to go with the guy that I have. The least amount of confidence in this Kyler Murray. And I I feel this way because of what I've seen the Rams do to him. When they contain him and make him try and throw over the offensive line, see over the offensive line, downfield, mistakes happen. The Rams have had a lot of success against him. And until I see differently, that would be my pick for the weak link of those quarterbacks. I mean, Brock Purdy's played well against the Rams. He's won games. Geno Smith has won games against the Rams. So for me, it's Kyler Murray. I'm with you, and that was my answer from the get-go. I know Kyler Murray came off of a season uh, where he was injured, and he did come back and help them win some games. But I have seen Geno Smith operate this Ryan Grubb offense in training camp, and I like what I see. He is in the best shape that we've seen him. He was one of the fastest players coming back uh, from, training, from the offseason in terms of time testing. He looks like he's 25 out there, and he is getting the ball out much quicker than we've seen in the past, and he's got more threats in the middle of the field. The, the main criticism of Russell Wilson was that he couldn't pass over the middle. Well, Geno Smith is doing that often with these tight ends. The tight end health will be a factor, I think, for him going forward. But Kyler Murray, it's just hard to trust and know what he's going to look like in a full season coming into this one. I know he's also in great shape, but I have questions about the offensive line. What's going to be interesting is Marvin Harrison. I think that's going to be a huge uh, game changer in how they have chemistry. So right now I'm going to say weakest would be Kyler Murray. All right, each of you, starting again with Robbie, who gives you the most confidence at quarterback in the NFC West? The most confidence has got to be Brock Purdy, right? With the surrounding uh, cast of characters he has there with the 49ers, nearly 70% completion percentage in his career, 44 touchdowns to only 15 interceptions. He has such a grasp of that Kyle Shanahan offense. That gives me confidence to say that Brock Purdy can be the best quarterback in the NFC West this year. Keyshawn, do you agree? Absolutely do agree. I think Brock Purdy is going to be easily the best quarterback in the NFC West this year. All right, Gerard in L.A., what do you think? I am going to go with my guy, Matthew Stafford, because I think the Rams have made up ground on the 49ers. Um, as long as they can keep Matthew Stafford upright, which should be the case, this offensive line uh, is rebuilt. They've add, they added uh, a few off-season off acquisitions. Um, when Matthew Stafford is healthy, he's the best quarterback in this division. He's the, you know, the only guy that's won a Super Bowl. Uh, when the, the Super Bowl was on the line against the Cincinnati Bengals, Matthew Stafford was perfect. It was a drive that will never be forgotten. Um, last year, the Rams went 10-6, and six and Matt Stafford missed two games. So I think the Rams have gained ground. Um, they have an amazing receiving core. Um, it's all about health. And if Matthew Stafford stays healthy, granted, that can be a big if then he's the best quarterback in the division, in my, in my opinion. 
Gerard, you and I have the exact same mind. I'm going with Matthew Stafford as well, just because of what we saw Puka Nakua do to the Seahawks last year. And he was phenomenal without Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup is back. Uh, I saw what he did at Eastern Washington and the Eagles and what he did is just that, that offense seems like it could really explode this year in particular. He's got the veteran leadership. He's got the confidence. And I wonder, I've only seen these as headlines, Keyshawn, so forgive me when it comes to Brock Purdy, that he might try to be someone he's not this year. I'm curious to see if that happens, and for Seahawks fans, I think they all hope that it happens, that he tries to do too much with all those weapons rather than just relying on the incredible offense that Kyle Shanahan produces and with the amazing weapons he's got in guys like Debo Samuel and potentially Brandon Ayuk. Well, just like that, and in a real NFL game, two minutes is really a closer to five. We will end it right there. Thanks to all three of you for joining us on the second week of the NFC West Huddle. We'll get together every week throughout the regular season, and if you missed any part of it, you can catch full episodes on the Fox Local app. Thanks again, and have a great night.